All right. If you if you have a Bible, please uh, turn together with me, if you will, uh, to the New Testament. We're in First Peter, First Peter in chapter three, and we're going to begin in verse eighteen. First Peter chapter three, verses eighteen through twenty-two. First Peter chapter three, verses eighteen through twenty-two. Where Peter writes, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and following. For Christ also suffered, or died, once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. This is the word of the Lord. I think it's going to be something that's apparent to all of us as believers in Jesus, that in order for you and for me to make sense of our sufferings, In this world, even as Christians, the only way that we could ever come to any sort of meaningful grips, I know, not exhaustive, but any sort of meaningful, purposeful grips with suffering in this world that we experience that can only happen through the cross of Jesus Christ. Through the cross of Jesus Christ. No matter whether we're unbelievers or Christians, blood-bought, we all have to encounter it in one way or another. Some of our sufferings have to do with things done to us unjustly. Other times, our suffering has to do with our sins that we've incurred, that we've sinned against God. But no matter what, whether we're the victims of this injustice or whether we're the perpetrators of the injustice, suffering is something that's part and parcel of our lives, even as Christians in this world. But the good news of the gospel and being a person of faith is that I can find even meaning and purpose in the midst of suffering. It's not to try to call suffering something that it's not, but it's to say everybody is looking for some sort of purpose, some sort of why, some sort of meaning that they can gain to be able to survive their purpose. Because if you don't, we got a word for that. It's actually called nihilism. Nihilism is the, is, the, is the last string. It's that last point at which there's no more meaning. There's no more purpose for my existence, especially in the middle of suffering. Peter's letter to this New Testament church, these young Christians, has really been addressing suffering in many ways. And up till now, we've seen the different ways that a Christian can experience suffering in this world. We saw that in relationship to governing authorities as citizens and how there could be injustice that takes place and how does a Christian live in relationship to especially governing authorities that are not believers or are not submitted to God's version or notion of justice. We saw that even among the servant and the master relationship or the employee and employer, if you want to make application in our case. And then we went on and we saw it even take place in the household, where you may have a situation that occurs even between spouses. And now here, we come back to Christ himself. Peter's trying to show us that the God that we worship, the God that came and entered into his own creation, is a God who himself experienced suffering, but not because of his own sins but the sins that he voluntarily came to bear. And we see that at the opening here in the first chapter. Let's look at it. Peter begins by saying, 
Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh. I'm sorry. For Christ also, I don't know why, I, I, I guess I want to preach chapter 4. Is that, Holy Spirit, what are you telling me? <laughs> for Christ also suffered, well, you could see why it makes sense. For Christ also suffered once for sins. So already right now, we're going to have a chance to look at the gospel right here. In order for us to appreciate or value the gospel at all, we've got to have a category for a Jesus that came and suffered and died. Notice, he doesn't say for his own sins, but for the sins that he came for. You see, this is significant because in the Old Testament, we understand that the priests brought animal sacrifices again and again and again, even to the point where on the annual Passover celebration, upwards of a quarter million animals were killed, slaughtered. It's a lot of blood. That's a, that's a lot of animals in one day, in one celebration. And this was a recurring event to be able to communicate the heinousness of sin and the holiness of God and the means by which if a man or a woman is going to get right at all, this is the way in which they're going to get right. And that's a practice. That was a ceremonial sacrifice that took place again and again and again all throughout God's people's history. But what makes Jesus's once for all, notice there, for Christ also suffered once for all for sins. Sacrifice unique is that when he came, he didn't bring the blood of bulls and goats and heifers into the courts. He brought his own blood. The Bible even tells us in Hebrews, you don't have to go there, but I want you to hear this powerful truth in Hebrews. The Bible says there in Hebrews 9:11. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, he entered once for all into the holy place, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. And so Peter here wants to lock our attention on Christ's suffering in our place. Theologians refer to this as substitutionary sacrifice, right? Substitutionary atonement. Yom Kippur, right? The day of atonement was a practice that the Jewish people experienced all throughout the Old Testament. And Jesus came to fulfill that day of atonement by being our substitute in our place. And so what this means is all of the punishment, all of the wrath, all of the judgment, all of the holy anger that I deserved to experience for my sins, God, in sending Jesus into this world, had him as that sacrifice in my place, that substitute. So everything that I rightfully deserved, Jesus undeservingly took and assumed for himself. And every way in which Jesus deserved to be seen and treated and valued in the sight of God, I undeservingly am now seen and treated and valued in the presence of God. And so he, he exchanged himself, if you will. It was that great exchange that took place on the cross. And this Jesus right here who experienced this suffering is not a suffering that was just. It was unjust but it was voluntary. It was voluntary. Jesus says, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I lay it down of my own accord. This is powerful. He goes on and he says, the righteous for the unrighteous. You see, friends, even when you and me experience different forms of injustice in this world, no matter what the context may be, we're still sinners. And at the end of the day, outside of Christ and outside of the grace of God, we know ultimately what we deserve. But in Jesus' case, there was nothing he ever did. There was nothing he ever said, nothing he ever thought that resulted in him having to experience what he had to undergo. You see, if I die... I can't die for your sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. I can die 
And I, I should die, Romans 6, 23, but the only death that I'm dying is for my sins. In Jesus's case, when the Bible says the righteous for the unrighteous, what it's saying is not only is he not dying for his sins because Romans 6, 23 can't apply to him because he never sinned and therefore he shouldn't have to die, but the death that he is dying, he's dying for others. The righteous for the unrighteous. This is powerful. He goes on and he says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. You see, the whole purpose in our Christian life, a lot of times people want to try to figure out what is the purpose? It's to bring us to God. It's not to look a certain way. It's not to dress a certain way. It's not to be a certain way. A lot of times we reduce Christianity to so many things that God never intended it to be. And Jesus came for one purpose, not to give you some dead religion, not to have us play church, but to bring us to who? To God, to God. In other words, the greatest gratitude that I could pay to God, the greatest service you and I, in response to his grace, could pay to him is to have this relationship with God. If you want to know, and if I want to know, what did his death accomplish? It brought me to God. You see, this kind of falls on deaf ears sometimes in our day and age, because everybody claims to have access to God, <laughs> right? Everybody claims to know God. Everybody claims to be a child of God. But what we have to understand is the moment sin was introduced into this world, the moment our original parents rebelled by going in a direction contrary to God's will, God's way, and God's word, that relationship was ruptured. You remember what God said to Adam in Genesis 2.17? Look, you may freely eat from all of the trees of the garden, but from the one tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, huh, you shall surely die. Literally in the Hebrew, it's dying, you shall die. They didn't die. They didn't keel over the moment they, right? They went on to continue to live, right? So what death was it? You got to be asking. It was multifold. It was spiritual. It was relational. It was physical. And if they didn't trust in God's provision, it was going to be eternal. The moment that they went in a direction contrary to God's will, I'm going somewhere here about bringing us to God, immediately they forfeited their relationship to God. So from that point onward, human beings were estranged from God. Adam, Adam, where are you? That would have been a question that would have never been asked prior to that act of rebellion. There would have been no point for God to... Be, Adam walked with God, the text tells us, in the cool of the day. <laughs> the Bible says, whatever that means, right? In the cool of the day, right? He walked with God, meaning he had fellowship. He had relationship with God. He was with God. He didn't need to be brought with God. He was already with him. But the moment sin was introduced into the world, it ruptured. It forfeited our relationship with God vertically. It forfeited our relationship. It just wasn't. They were naked and ashamed, the Bible says. And then eventually, they ended up dying. We see Adam's law record. He died eventually. And every single person has, through one man, sin entered into the world, Romans 5, 12, and death by sin. And therefore, all have sinned, and so all die. You see, we know that we're guaranteed death, one death per person, because we've all sinned in Adam. And so if you want to ask me, what is the purpose for God being about what God has been about since then. What's God been up to? What was the purpose of Christmas? What was the purpose in God entering into his own creation? What was the purpose in God sending us his own son to be born of a virgin? What was the purpose of Christianity? Is so that men and women, human beings on this earth might be brought to God. That's our purpose in life. Our greatest purpose in life is to be brought back to our maker. And Jesus here is being declared as one who accomplished this. He suffered so that you and I might be brought to God. Which means I can't go to God by myself. 
I can't bridge that chasm between what stands between me and God on my own. God had to come and bridge that chasm. And he did. This is why we sing. This is why we worship. This is why we love him. This is why he deserves our praise. It's because I could never have done this. I was the furthest thing away from God. The last thing I wanted to do is to come. I was running in the opposite direction with my life. But because of God's goodness in Christ and because of God's relentless love toward you and me, what did he do? He didn't bring us to church. Before he brought me to church. Oh, he brought me to church. Before, me, he, before he, he brought me to men's group. Before he brought me to Bible study. Before he even brought me to a Bible. Before he brought me to... He brought me to God. I think we need to remember this. Sometimes we, we start in the wrong places. I know sometimes we get frustrated. We get disappointed. You're probably discouraged with all that effort you've made in trying to reach that person that you love and you care about. But let's not lose sight of this. Before you think that's what she needs, that's what he needs, I'll tell you this. If they can just get brought to God, you won't have any problems. Church, Bible study, prayer meetings, service, faithfulness, it'll all come. Why? Because one now. <laughs> the main thing, right? The main, keep the main thing the main thing. What is that? He brought us to God. Oh, the Pharisees tried to bring their followers to a lot of stuff. Pharisees brought them to themselves. The Pharisees tried to bring people to all sorts of, to their own religion. They tried to bring them to their own system and, and ways of doing things, to their own traditions. Jesus showed up on the scene and just blew their whole system out of the water. And he says, if you've seen me, you've seen God. <laughs> he brought us to God brought us to God. Being put to death, the Bible says, in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. You know, some people try to suggest, and you probably get this um, with people that you're trying to witness to, uh, Jesus, you know, it was a hoax. It was, it was, a, it was, it was a coma. It was, it was an attempted death. There's all sorts of quote-unquote explanations for what exactly took place with Jesus. Did he really die? He died. He died. And Peter is pointing out that he died, but he died physically. When he says he's alive in his spirit, what he's saying is his spirit, his, his eternal spirit went on to continue to live. Death is not the cessation of existence. It's just the transition from this life to the next. Nobody ceases at the point of death. It's just a transition point. And what the Bible is trying to point out is Jesus' death was genuine because Jesus' death was real. It says here, he died where? In the flesh. Remember, when he was on the cross, it was customary, according to crucifixion, that people would try to climb up as much as they could to just get one last half of breath because their body is collapsing as their feet are being pinned to the, to the stakes along with their hands. And the, when the body collapses, you can't, your diaphragm as well collapses along with it. And they'll do their... They're, they'll do anything that they can to just get a last gasp. But Jesus, he didn't because he had already died. And when they went up to, to break his bones, they noticed that he was already dead, which is why that prophecy was fulfilled. Not a bone was broken. And so what did they decide to do? He says, since he's already dead, they took a spear and they punctured him on the side. And what came out? Blood and water, which is an indication that someone has terminated. He died. He died so that your salvation might not be in question, so that you and I would know that we have, in fact, been brought to God, not because we feel like we're close to God, but because it's true. It's true. It's true. Verse 19, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. Huh? <laughs> Keep in mind, God's been true to his word from the beginning onward. Remember in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17, God promised, he preached himself. The first preacher was God. And he promised there that the seed of the woman 
was going to crush the head of the serpent. He may bruise your heel, but he's going to bruise your head. In other words, Jesus is going to accomplish God's purpose in the world through crushing Satan's head, even though in the effort and the attempt to do so, he's going to be wounded himself. He suffered. That effort on Jesus' part has been challenged by the devil from the beginning. We see him in the garden going after God's purposes. We see him during the days of Noah. We see him all throughout the prophets. We see him at the birth of Jesus where, where Herod wants to destroy or kill every child at the age of Jesus. We see him at the time that Jesus is about to enter into his public ministry in the, in the wilderness where he's fasting to be tempted by the devil. We see him in the hearts and the minds and the intents of the religious leaders and the Pharisees of Jesus' day during his public ministry. Satan, the devil, doing everything that he can to thwart God's purposes by dealing with this seed. And what ended, what ended up happening? The moment he thought he had him, we see him in Judas. And ultimately, we see him on the cross through the men and the individuals that were responsible for putting him on there. But the death that Satan thought he had Jesus in was actually Jesus' victory. You see, what he's referring to here when he says, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, these are demonic spirits. These aren't unbound spirits. We understand that Satan, there's a number of demons and there are a number of spirits that are present on the earth at work. The Bible tells us that the devil is the god of this world, right? Second Corinthians chapter 4, uh, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that he's the spirit of the power of the air, right? We refer to him as that. But here, what we notice is he's referring to the days of Noah. So what could he be referring to? Well, in order to understand that, you've got to go to Genesis, and you've got to go to Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, we see exactly what Peter is quoting or referring to. When man, Genesis 6, 1, began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, notice this, this is a technical term, the sons of God, so these are fallen angels, saw that the daughters of man, women, were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim, we'll talk about that in a second here, were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. So what we see here is Satan, along with a third of the angels, before he was Satan, fell. We know this is prior to Adam and Eve's create, being created. Along with that, once human beings were created as a part of God's creation, shortly after that, we see Satan having fallen in his fallen state, entering not the daughters of men, but creatures, living creatures, in the form of what? Genesis 3, a serpent. So, so demonically possessing creatures and beginning to have activity and interaction with human beings. And then here, what we're noticing is that these fallen spirits, these fallen angels, which were of a different category, of different sort of wickedness, and Peter talks about this in 2 Peter, that it's not just the kind of demons that we see that are loose, that have, have a way of harassing and impacting a lot of people's lives, even now on the earth. These are of a different sort that are bound. That, that's how we know. They're not loose. They're bound. You can go to Revelation 5 and 7 and 9, and you can see where God talks about where they're bound. He refers to it there as a bottomless pit, if you will. A bottomless pit. Why is this important? Because Peter is drawing attention to this because Jesus is demonstrating through his triumph over sin, over Satan, over hell, over every demon, and over death, that his is the victory. He's demonstrating 
that what they may have sought to try to do by overthrowing, what do they do? What are they attacking? Marriage. What are they doing? They're getting married to human beings. We, we know we don't have any problem understanding that angels inhabit human beings. You'll see that from time to time, all throughout the Old Testament, even for good reasons. We see in Hebrews that some people may have entertained angels even unaware, the Bible says. Right? So we don't have a full concept of this, of what's going on. But what we understand is angels are created beings. They're not creator. There's God, creator, and then there's his creation. But even among his creation, there's distinctions to be made among his creation. There are good, unfallen angels who worship God and do God's bidding and service. And then there are fallen, wicked, evil angels who've rebelled against God's will and God's ways. And then there are human beings. But then there are angels that will manifest themselves in creation in the bodies of human beings. We shouldn't have any problem with this. We see through the life and the ministry, especially of Jesus, along with the apostles, where they have to regularly carry out exorcisms and, and, and cast out demons. Where are those demons? They're inhabiting people. And so here, what we see are these fallen angels are coming and they're inhabiting these women and having children to be able to populate this earth. Why is it so significant? For this reason, verse five, the Lord saw after all of this had a chance to happen for a while and a generation raised up, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Satan is thinking that he's succeeding. I know you created them so that they might, Genesis 1, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with your glory. I know you wanted them to have dominion and subdue and do your work, but guess what's happening now? Guess what's beginning to take place? The enemy is beginning to multiply his efforts rather than God. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on, in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to the face. It grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made him, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And if we could read the account, we know it's not just Noah, but it's also the seven that were together with him who also found favor in the sight of the Lord. In other words, God had to start all over through this flood. The reason why you don't see them anymore is because they were wiped out through this global catastrophe. And Peter, drawing upon that, picks it up in relationship to Jesus' death on the cross, and it says, Jesus went to those bound spirits and he proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formally did not obey. That I'm king, that I'm Lord, that I'm God. And, that what, and you need to know this. Whatever the enemy may mean for evil, God always intends for good. That whatever it is that the devil may, had, may have had up his sleeve in Jesus' place, God is always sovereign. The same God that was with Jesus through not only his suffering, but his victory over his death is the same God that's in your life. Paul tells us in Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son, but freely gave him up for you all, how will he not also graciously, freely give you what you're in need of? He will. He will. And we see that here in Jesus' declaration of his victory over not just the grave, but over every principality, over every power, over every demon in hell, over every bound and unbound spirit that sought to destroy God's purposes. Because they formally, the Bible goes on to say, did not obey. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight, persons were brought safely through water. Notice, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some look at this and want to believe that this is referring to water baptism. Peter's not referring to water baptism at this point. He's referring to a dry baptism. What he's referring to is our spiritual baptism, which is what baptism should point to. I know there are some who suggest or who even teach that baptism saves, which they hold to as baptismal regeneration. We don't hold to that here in this church or as Christians. We believe in the importance and the necessity of baptism. By the way, if you haven't been baptized, you need to see somebody because we firmly believe in baptism because Jesus said so. <laughs> and Jesus taught us to continue to observe this ordinance until he comes. But the real baptism has to do with baptism signifies. And that's the reality of the Christian life. You see, you and I can get dunked all we want. But unless our heart has been transformed, it means nothing. Baptism has everything to do with the picture that we see in Noah's case. You see, when Noah and his seven people went into the ark, they were covered. God's wrath, God's judgment, and God's punishment came in the form of the water. And anyone who was not hidden in the ark, anyone who did not take their refuge in the ark experienced God's, God's wrath and God's punishment. Similarly, friends, when you and I recognize who we are outside of Jesus and what ultimately we deserve from God, the only way you and I, or anyone for that matter, can, is capable of escaping God's judgment, capable of escaping God's wrath, is to hide ourselves inside of the ark, and that ark is Jesus. Where you and I take refuge is not in our church attendance. It's not in signing up to serve. It's, it's not in, well, if you knew my mom, it's not in a praying grandmother. It's, it's not in, oh, I go to a great church. No, you and I are to take refuge in Christ. I can't ride the coattails of another Christian. I've got to have a confidence all myself in Jesus. And he's saying this baptism, this baptism right here is what saves you. The one that recognizes outside of Christ, I'm a sinner deserving of judgment. But in Jesus, because of Jesus, through Jesus, there's salvation to be found. The Bible says he, speaking of the father, made him who knew no sin to be sin so that you and I might be made the righteousness of God. You see, the, God looked at his son. That's why he said, my God, my God, Eloi, Eloi, my God, why have you forsaken me? In other words, Jesus had to experience estrangement. Isn't that the purpose why he brought us, why he came to bring us to God? Jesus experienced estrangement from God so that you might know fellowship with God. He became, he never sinned. He wasn't a sinner but he allowed his father to see him the way I only deserve to be seen so that I can enjoy a life I otherwise would have never known. This is the gospel. This is the gospel here. This is true baptism. So that when I go into the waters, I'm representing what has already taken place. Neb died. The world that Noah and his family knew before they walked into the ark was gone by the time they walked out after the waters receded. It was a different world, unlike the one that they knew when they first walked in. Similarly, you and I should have that same experience in our Christian life. The, there was a world that you and I knew before we entered into relationship through faith into Jesus Christ, the ark of our salvation. And now that we come out, we should come out into a, a different world. It's a world where we see things as God sees them. We live for God and for his glory. You see, I can't bring that world into this relationship with God. No man can serve both God and mammon. You're either going to love the one and hate the other, but you can't serve both. And in order to die to one, 
and experience a new life. I've got to experience this baptism. It's this baptism that saves. If you want to know that real, genuine Christian life, it's not by trying harder. It's not by trying to be a better Christian. It's by trusting in the one who is everything that you are not. That's it. That's it. It's recognizing I could never be, but he is. He was. He continues to be. And I trust in him. He's my baptism. He's my ark. He's my salvation. He's my refuge. He's my hope. And if you look to him, you know salvation is what he's saying here. And he concludes, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him, and rightfully so. He deserves it. He deserves the rewards of his sufferings. The lamb deserves the rewards of his sufferings. He came and he humbled himself, but now God has exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, friends. Yes, right now, he may be seen the way he is. He may be scoffed at, but I'm telling you right now, Jesus is no longer that suffering servant. Church, Jesus is risen. He's not only risen, the Bible tells us he's ascended. He's not only ascended, he's seated. The Bible says he's seated at the right hand of God and soon to come. And the Bible tells us that he's coming on a horse with a sword in his thigh. With all authority. His is the power. His is the glory. His. His is the glory. Both now and forever. Isn't that what we sing? And so I, w- I want us to experience the weight of this that I believe Peter was hoping. These young Christians scattered due to persecution, feeling hopeless, feeling like, will we even have another day? Will will we live? Is there even any sense to all of this? And what does he point them to? He doesn't fix their world. He doesn't promise them a utopia. But he points to them who Christ is and what Christ has done and how that's going to be the reality. Until then, we experience different forms of suffering. Maybe you're going through them right now. Maybe you're passing through. You've been on the receiving end of injustice. You've experienced it on different levels and you're wondering, how could anybody get away with that? I want you to know that Jesus, as your God, understands exactly what that's like. No one wants to belittle or lighten any degree of suffering that anyone has had to undergo. But there's hope is what I'm trying to say. That because Jesus has suffered for you, and not only suffered, he triumphed is the point. He triumphed over every bound and unbound evil, fallen angel, angelic spirit. He triumphed over death. He triumphed over hell. He triumphed over sin. He triumphed over Satan. He triumphed over every giant in your life so that you can have hope today that even in the midst of your suffering, you can know if he triumphed, then, and I'm in him, I know one day I will triumph. I will triumph. It may not look that way right now. It may be bleak. It may be hard to see. This may be hard to carry. This may be a load that I wish I could put on someone else. But I know if my God did that, then... I know I can see another day. You can see another day, friends. Look to Christ, not as a suffering servant, but as a triumphant one, as a triumphant one. Amen? Let's stand together right now. God, this is not easy. I know life can be very confusing. And I know, Lord, It's very tempting to want to go down that spiral. But I pray, Lord, you guard the hearts and the minds of your people. 
Lord, deliver us from any sort of hopelessness due to all that we're passing through. God, I pray right now, allow that message, allow that reality of you triumphing, of you conquering, of you as a victor to seep into our soul right now, Lord, I pray. God, I thank you for your church. I thank you for your people. Lord, we recognize that our, our faith, it's, it's not what it is because of the size of it. And that brings me great encouragement. It's what it is because of the object of our faith. That even if somebody is here today and feeling like, I wish I could believe this. Even if you have the faith of a mustard seed, God can recognize that. One man once said, I believe, help my unbelief. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that it's not our faith in our faith. It's our faith in you, in who you are. Help us to see you rightly today. God, strengthen the hearts of this church. Put a courageous spirit within each and every one of us. Lord, I pray that we face our days, not in and of our own strength, but through your might. Lord, I thank you, Lord God, that you are not just with us, you're in us, as we sang and as we prayed and as we reminded each other. Holy Spirit, you're our presence. You're our power. You're our enablement. You're our hope. You're our comforter. You're our refuge. You're our confidant. And we look to you today. Lord, be with this church. Help us to rise above wherever it is we've been. May we see a new day because of you in our day. God, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you, Lord God, for having brought us to God, Lord Jesus. Thank you that we no longer have to be estranged. Thank you that we no longer have to be in the dark. We are children of the day. Hallelujah. We belong to you. And we're going to celebrate that all our days. Lord, as we conclude this program of ours, would you be with us as we go our, our separate ways? Would you lead us? Would you encourage us, Lord, throughout our days and our relationships? Help us, Lord, to navigate the things that we still have to be responsible for. Help us, Lord God, to know how to have wisdom for the decisions that still need to be made in our lives. But I pray, Lord God, that we keep our eyes fixed upon you. You're our hope. You're our refuge. You're our rock. You're our hiding place. You're our ark. We thank you and we bless you and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. God bless y'all. God bless you guys.